really good to be with you guys. And so I wanted to give you a little background because I was supposed to be here a year ago, and about three days before I was supposed to be here, um, I was living, we were living in a townhouse right behind the Dominican House of Studies, uh, which is the entity that sponsors these events. Um, and I, was, I lived in a four-story townhouse, and I stepped off the top stair on the fourth floor, and I ruptured my quad tendon, which is the thing that connects your quadriceps to your knee on this leg. Completely detached it, had to be carried four flights down. So I had this mental association of this, uh, <laughs> this trauma, because it happened, I had to you know, email and say, I don't think I'm coming anywhere, so it was weeks of physical therapy, so I'm still actually recovering. And I almost didn't get here tonight, because I got on a plane in Chicago, I was coming from Missouri at another talk, and the plane broke that I was on, which is always a bad sign, and we had to file off, yeah. So, so I actually changed clothes in the Catholic Center. And, uh, <laughs> we actually ironed it, and so it was really good to be here. Um, and so I'm actually a philosopher that teaches in a business school. And so I spend um, really more time, I had not planned on spending most of my career trying to defend to Catholics and other Christians the free enterprise system. That is, to defend it as the best of the live alternatives. And so I wrote this book called Money, Green, and God in 2009, and we redid it again this summer. When I first wrote it, my editor was sort of mad at me because I have a whole chapter about communism and socialism in the beginning. And it's because when I went to college in the 1980s, I was actually transfixed by socialism. I read the Communist Manifesto my freshman year. I knew absolutely nothing about economics. I wasn't even studying economics or business. And it sort of got me thinking like a socialist. And I spent years sort of struggling with this. I eventually worked my way out of it, realized the mistakes of that. But then Soviet Union collapsed. I thought, OK, this argument is over. Nobody's going to talk about capitalism versus socialism anymore. And so I did other things. I ended up back on college campuses in the late 1990s and found out that actually the same exact economic ideas that I'd had as a freshman in 1985 were just as popular then, 15 years later. And now, you guys, probably none of you in this room even have a memory of the Cold War. You have no memory uh, of the Soviet Union and the Soviet experiment. As if you I don't know if you follow these polls, but since 2016, Gallup uh, and the Pew Charitable Trust have been doing polls. They say millennials, but they actually mean well, you guys are mostly Gen Z, right? You're not millennials. And so what they mean is young folk, usually. And so you kind of got to look at the details. But every time one of these polls is taken, a larger percentage of the young population, of the youth, so from like 35 and down, say they like socialism. And this most recent poll that I saw, six of 10 really Gen Z, so basically 18 to 25-year-olds, say that they wish they lived in a socialist society. Now, what they don't do in these polls is define the word socialism first. They never do that. And the reason is if you look up Merriam-Webster's di dictionary definition, I'll give you two of the main definitions. The first one is an economic system in which private property is abolished. All right, so nobody owns stuff. So you wonder, well, okay, who owns it? Well, that's the second definition. It's a political and economic system in which the state owns the means of production. So in other words, all the productive property, the factories and the farms and the shops, Right, are owned and controlled by the state, which then dictates how much people are paid and how many size D, uh, you know, size 11 tennis shoes are going to be made, all that sort of stuff. That's socialism. Now, if they defined it that way, right, abolition of private property and the state controls and owns everything, and then asks people a question, now, would you like to live in that society? And let me give you some examples. The Soviet Union, North Korea, uh, People's Republic of China prior to 1978, right? Venezuela's trying to do it. The polls would probably be quite different, wouldn't they? And so this is really the problem. And what I realize, and that's what's sort of frustrating about this topic, is that none of us mostly, unless you've studied these issues, even knows what these words mean. What we have is mental pictures of the word capitalism and the word socialism, and we invest meaning in a kind of an emotional uh, uh, um, interest in these words, but we don't actually know what they mean, so we never actually even think clearly about it. So if I don't do anything else tonight but help you think more clearly about these issues, I feel like it was worth, um, it, maybe not worth falling down the stairs, but it was definitely <laughs> worth coming down here, all right? But I want to talk specifically about this for Catholics. Now, it's a, there's a kind of broad moral question. So everybody, it's not like they're these uniquely Catholic moral concerns. Uh, whereas Catholics are concerned about the poor and fellow human beings and nobody else is. In fact, most of these concerns are kind of broadly shared uh, by people of goodwill, but 
There is a developed uh, thinking on these issues called Catholic social teaching. And we can spend a bunch of time on that. So let me just simplify what Catholic social teaching is. It's basically this body of work written by popes starting in 1891 with Pope Leo XIII, an encyclical called Rerum Novarum. All right, now this is the kind of the first time that a pope said, okay, I'm gonna look at the economic system and try to explain this because at the time there were all these socialist revolutions happening in Europe and he thought, okay, what are we gonna do with this? Right, so there's a series of encyclicals that were written and they're not consistent. Don't think that if you read all these encyclicals, you're gonna get a detailed Catholic political party platform. It, uh, that's not how it works. What you get is a series of these kind of perennial principles, right? Principles that are knowable by reason, but also in revelation, uh, applied to the contemporary situation. So that starts in, 19, in 1891 with Leo XIII. And then in 1991, right at the time that the Soviet Union was collapsed, literally right when it was happening, uh, Pope John Paul II wrote an encyclical called Centesimus Annus, which means in the hundredth year. And so that's literally the first sentence is in the hundredth year since Leo XIII wrote Rerum Novarum. So it's a reflection over the last hundred years. And he's saying, okay, what do we, um, wh what shall we say about these economic questions now? We've had an entire century of communism. We've had this thing called capitalism. He, remember, was from Poland, uh, which was the first country to break away in the Eastern Bloc from the control of the Soviet Union. And he did something that I, I hate to say it, but popes rarely do, and they is speak really clearly about these economic issues. Popes, popes, just like everyone else, tend to just use words, right? And they kind of assume everybody knows what they mean. Well, this is what John Paul says in Centesimus Annus. He asks this very question. He says, okay, so these, these countries have collapsed and this Eastern European countries are trying to decide what to do in the Soviet Union. All those countries that, that were part of the Soviet Union have now split off. And so what do we do? He says, is this the model? He's talking about the model of Western Europe and the United States. He says, is this the model which we ought, ought to be proposed to the countries of the third world which are searching? for the path to true economic and civil progress. So is this like ca capitalism essentially? He says the answer is obviously complex. And I'm gonna give you part of this. And this is how these encyclicals are. And so if you ever do a study group, you'll spend a bunch of time just trying to parse these super long sentences like <laughs> this, right? So I'm just gonna give you a taste of it. But so he's saying, okay, well, he says the answer is actually complex. He says, if by capitalism, is meant an economic system which recognizes the fundamental and positive role of business, the market, private property, and the resulting responsibility for the means of production, as well as free human creativity in the economic sector, then the answer is certainly in the affirmative. So if you define it this way, private property and a, a judicial system, in other words, the rule of law, um, and these kind of structured activities in which people are able to actually fulfill their creative potential, then yes, to answer in the affirmative means yes, that's what we should commend of the choices. He said, but he goes on. He says, but if by capitalism is meant a system in which freedom in the economic sector is not circumscribed within a strong juridical framework, in other words, doesn't have the rule of law, right? Which places it at the service of human freedom in its totality and which sees it as a particular aspect of that freedom, the core of which is ethical and religious, then the reply is certainly negative. Okay, so let me boil this down for you. I make students write uh, uh, um, short essays at an eighth grade level, precisely so they don't start writing this way, right? It's very hard to follow this. So basically what he's saying is if you define it one way, and it turns out the way he defines it is the way capitalism is defined, if you look it up in the dictionary, then yes, we can affirm that. We should, we should commend it to the third world countries that are trying to decide what to do. If we define it as the sort of law, the jungle, and everybody does whatever they want to do, Right, then no, that's not, we're not gonna commend that. All right, and so really, if you're wondering if a Catholic can defend capitalism, John Paul II has already told us. As long as you define it properly and you understand what you're defending, absolutely. But here's the problem, and he actually says in this pack passage, he says, though perhaps we can uh, affirm it, though even though it would perhaps be more appropriate to speak of a business economy, a market economy, or simply the free economy. In other words, he's recognizing that oh, there's just something about that word capitalism, right? So I want you to think for a minute, because again, most people don't ha walk around with the dictionary definition of words in their heads. So everybody has a mental image of the word capitalism or the word capitalist in particular, all right? So try to think of movies of people that are bu you know, businessmen, right, or bankers, 
right? Inevitably have top hats. Okay, just try to, to conjure in your mind what is the, the predominant mental image. If you had to boil it down to one image, what would it be? How many of you saw something like this in your head, <laughs> all right? It's burned into us. It's encoded in our DNA. This is Uncle Pennybags from the Monopoly game. So you might not know, the Monopoly game uh, was actually invented by a woman that was an, a socialist, an American socialist in the 1920s, to try to um, essentially dissuade Americans that the capitalism was bad and to become socialists. And so thought, this will make everybody socialist. So Americans love the game. They didn't get the lesson. They just, I like monopolizing stuff and buying everybody up. You know, it was great. It didn't work. But what successfully they did is they created this really this caricature of what business is about. And if you doubt me, right, that that's the predominant image, try to think of a movie or a great piece of literature in which a business person, as a business person, is a good guy. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a freebie. It's a wonderful life. George Bailey, I'm sorry, because that's the only one, practically. It's basically the only one. And even that, George Bailey, is balanced by evil Mr. Potter, right, who's a more memorable character. Because that's the one, whether you're watching Mary Poppins or you're reading, you know, The Merchant of Venice or whatever, it's always a bad guy. And yet the normative way in which wealth is created and poverty is alleviated in this universe that God created is business. It's not charity, right, it's not magic, it's business. And yet we have this overwhelmingly negative image of it. So why is that? Well, part of it is that we don't define our terms carefully. So let's, so I'm going to just avoid the word capitalism altogether. A more, a, a more provocative way of saying this is, would, should Catholics defend capitalism, right? And Ten years ago, that's what I would have said, but I know, welcome, I know that, that what it does is it immediately turns a lot of people off because they have that mental association. So let's use the word free enterprise. It has the word free in it. We like that, right? It's the word enterprise in it. What is this? Well, it's essentially the positive definition of capitalism that John Paul II mentioned in 1991. It's a system with the rule of law, so it's not a system where everybody gets to do what he wants to do. That is not a free market, right? That's the law of the jungle. You could think of uh, the Lord of the Flies. Some of you may have read that in high school. A bunch of English schoolboys crash land on a, an island. For some reason, the adults all die and the boys live, right? And it works great for about 24 hours. And then the big kids enslave and lord it over the week and start torturing and killing them, as would be expected, right? Um, that's not a free enterprise. That's not a free market, right? In fact, Lord Acton, a, a 19th century British statesman, said, liberty is the delicate fruit of a mature civilization. In other words, having a society that actually enjoys freedom or liberty is something you achieve, and it's actually really hard to maintain the balance. It's not the normal state of society or of human beings. So you need rule of law. In other words, you need a functioning government that enforces contracts, that punishes people who murder and rape and steal and defraud, all those kinds of things, all right? And that is also subject to the rule of law. So it can't be an all-powerful state that is always in your business. It's a, gov a state itself has to be subject to the rule of law and to be limited by other things, limited by the rights of individuals, limited by families, limited by churches and voluntary organizations. Get the idea? That's hard to do. Every society has a state that does something, but most societies have states that violate the rule of law. In the 20th century, just in the communist experiments I mentioned a minute ago, any guesses how many people were killed by their own governments? A hundred million people at a minimum by their own governments. So that's not the rule of law. Private property, right? And private property includes detailed titling and contracts so you can say exactly who owns something and it's enforced by courts and things like that. And then when you get those, you get economic freedom. And economic freedom is just basically the condition in which you can enter into contracts, you can you can decide what kind of job you want to do. You can negotiate for salary, right? You can decide where you want to live and all those kinds of things. It's not really hard to start a business. That's economic freedom, all right? And when you get that, you get free enterprise. And if you define it that way, I would maintain there's actually no better alternative. We don't know of an example of a system that is better for doing what you'd want an economy to do. If you want an economy to, at a minimum, allow a society to, to emerge from absolute poverty, allow people uh, to flourish, allow people to sort of pursue their dreams and to create value for others, there actually isn't an alternative, right? Now, there are variations in tax systems and things, but this is sort of the only thing we found that actually works in that way. So why don't we appreciate it? Why do so many Catholics, in fact, 
when I told you about those polls, right, that, that's sort of the general public. It's also true of Catholics, this kind of basic idea about uh, free enterprise and socialism. Well, what I discovered years ago in thinking about this is that what we do is we import false ideas about the nature of economic reality into our understanding. And so then when we try to apply our moral concerns to the economy, we, we, they're tied up in these, these misunderstandings, these myths about really the nature of reality, about the way the economy actually works. And because of that, it distorts and clouds our thinking <laughs> When we're, when we're uh, sort of analyzing this. So I, can, I don't have time to give you all the myths. There's sort of eight big myths. If you're curious, it's actually in this book. Um, they're the big myths that prevent us from thinking clearly about wealth, poverty, and free enterprise. But let me give you the three, kind of three biggies that I think do the most, the most work in terms of distorting people's thinking. First is what I call the greed myth. Now, the greed myth is not the idea that some people are greedy. That's not a myth, right? Uh, we're all fallen, we're all affected by sin, so there are greedy business people and butchers and brewers and bakers and dentists and youth ministers and priests. So the, the, the existence of greed is not the greed myth. The greed myth is the idea that the essence of the free enterprise system is greed. In other words, that it needs greed and that it actually feeds greed, right? So that the essence of it is like this. Now I can give you basically any example of any movie right, about any business person, just pick one at random, is probably going to assume this, right? You're gonna sort of treat the business person as if he or she is essentially greedy. But I, you could say, well, yeah, but those are caricatures written by, by critics of the free enterprise system. What's depressing is that the most widely read defender of capitalism in the 20th century also propagated the greed myth. This is Ayn Rand. Now, if, if any of you read Rand, a few of you, I know I'm in Louisiana, okay. And so there's even a female that's read Rand, that's good. And so it's usually, when I was in college, it was like all of my friends all for some reason had to read Atlas Shrugged at one point, you know. And I read it my senior year when I was supposed to actually be studying for German final and got sort of trapped down in page 500 somewhere. Um, and it sort of transfixes you because Rand had this one insight that the, the entrepreneur, the person, right, who takes risk in pursuit of a vision of creativity is a heroic figure. She's basically the only person that ever thought to actually make this person a heroic figure. And so that's why she's still widely read. About 300,000 copies of her books are still bought every year, decades after her death. But Rand is this weird and idiosyncratic character. She was a hardcore atheist. She had a philosophy called objectivism, and it was a form of egotism, which is what philosophers call a type of philosophy, in which everything ultimately and morally is defined in terms of the self or the ego. So basically, Rand's moral philosophy was this, is that um, to determine whether something is good or not, right, you determine, okay, is, this, is it the result and is it consistent with your own desire for self-assertion, right? And if it is, if it's in your own interest, right, then it's good. And if it's not, then it's bad, right? It's a really simple moral philosophy, right? It also leaves something to be desired, right? It doesn't seem to fit really well with most people's moral intuitions and certainly not with the natural law. Um, now, she got it in her head at some point, and I think, I can't prove this, but I think she met a priest in the 20s in New York. She came from the Soviet Union as an exile. She was in New York, and I think she was with a priest who was a socialist and told her, that Christianity required socialism. She had just come from the Soviet Union, so she hates socialism, so that's terrible. She moves to California to be a playwright. And so she writes a book called The Fountainhead. It kind of made her a minor celebrity. Then she wrote Atlas Shrugged in 1957, which made her a sensation. And both of the, all of, basically all of her novels are about man against the machine, basically. It's some entrepreneur, some men, some women, uh, that have a desire to create something and to assert themselves and they have some kind of oppressive system that prevents them from doing it. Um, and so there's you know, lots of sort of interesting things in this. But what's weird about her moral philosophy is she ends up elevating greed and selfishness to the level of a virtue. In fact, she has a book called The Virtue of Selfishness. And this is what she says in the book. She says, capitalism and altruism are incompatible. They're philosophical opposites. They cannot coexist in the same man or in the same society. Now what's altruism? What, what comes to mind when you hear that word? Kindness. Kindness? Yeah, who do you think of when you think of an altruistic person? 
Mother Teresa. Again, just like the Uncle Pennybags, Mother Teresa, right? Okay, now this is a, there's a subtlety here because all, altruism comes from the Latin word alter, which means other. And so altruism, strictly speaking, just means acting for the benefit of the other. Okay, but Rand defined it idiosyncratically. She defined it as acting for the benefit of the other at your own expense. So if you do something for someone else, but it causes you harm, that's altruism. Now notice if it's defined that way, remember she has this egoist philosophy in which you determine the morality of something by whether or not it benefits you. Right? And so if something causes you harm, and altruism, she said, did, that's got to be a bad thing. All right? Now, there is a type of altruism that we'll call self-sacrifice. That's Mother Teresa, in which someone is, gives of themselves even to the point by the of death, as John says. He's, of course, talking about Christ, that no greater love has any man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. That's a type of altruism, but it, think of it as a subset. It's a type of altruism that we'll call self-sacrifice. All right? Now, this is something Rand didn't consider. Is there another kind of altruism in which you can act for the benefit of another person, but it also benefit you? That's not something she ever considered or ever entertained. And we'll talk, that's a fatal error that she made, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Because this is the kind of key to getting what happens in free enterprise, and she completely misunderstood it. So if you read Rand, and then you compare her to actual famous great business people, they're always kind of unreal. They're not actually real. They're, they're sort of caricatures. And to get really what I think is the, the genius of the free enterprise system, we have to turn back a couple of centuries to a Scottish moral philosopher named Adam Smith, who wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations. He wrote two books, actually. One called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. We won't talk about that tonight. And he wrote this book, The Wealth of Nations. And that's a book almost no one reads, because it's a big, thick book with pages and pages about pen factories and the trading of pens and all and tariffs on you know, British supplies and things. But the book is the first book. And he's consolidated, if people don't know this, he consolidated all these insights of Spanish scholastics and Catholic scholastic philosophers and theologians who had figured out a lot of stuff about the nature of prices and trade. And he basically was arguing uh, for a free enterprise system against what the British Empire was doing at the time, all right, which is what's called mercantilism, where you control trade. So they would set up trading partners like the colonies here, but then they would monopolize it and control it. So it wasn't really free trade. And so he writes this book, The Wealth of Nations. And nobody reads the book, but they have usually read a few quotes. And so people, he's often known as the apostle of self-interest. And he also made popular this idea of the market as an invisible hand. And that's what most people know. And so I'll just stick with that. But I want to show you just from two quotes from Smith that he has this really, really important and interesting argument. So here's the first one. Now, he says stuff like this all over the place. So I'm not just cherry picking a quote. So this is just the representative sample. He says, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. All right, so just uh, let that sort of settle in your mind for a little bit. Now, she, is he saying that selfishness is a virtue, or that greed is good, that the brewer ought to be greedy? No, he's not saying anything like that, is he? OK, so remember that. Here's the second quote. There's two places that we know of where he uses the phrase invisible hand, and this is one example of it. It says, in spite of their natural selfishness and rapacity, business people are led by an invisible hand, and thus, without intending it, without knowing it, advance the interest of the society. Right, now, what is he saying here? There's actually several things. So let me unpack this. So this is the only subtle point, right? So I know it's that clock's wrong, right? So it's 7.30. So this is, all, it, it, this is the only place where I'm going to really require your neurons for five minutes, OK? <laughs> and then it's all really easy, because I want, I want you to make some really important distinctions. If you make these distinctions, you'll understand something that 90% of economists don't get right. I'm reading an, a great book by an economist at MIT right now, and he doesn't make the distinctions that need to be made. So the first distinction is this, the difference between self-interest, mere self-interest, and selfishness. Selfishness is a disorder. Selfishness is a vice because it's a disorder. It's, disorders are always disorders of something that's good. So what would the good thing be? Well, there, there's a proper domain of your interest in your control. It's a, this kind of circle around yourself right? that involves your own well-being, but also the well-being of your family and your friends and those that are around you. Think of that as your self-interest. 
Every time you take a breath, right? every time you eat a decent meal, every time you study, every time you show up to class on time, sleep eight hours, look both ways before you cross the street, brush your teeth, take your vitamins, you're acting in your self-interest. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is that, well, it's a necessary evil. I have to, eh, I feel bad about it, but you don't have to breathe. So I, there's really nothing I can do about it. No, I mean, God made us as bodily creatures. We exist in time and place. We're made of matter, right? So we have to do these things. That is in our nature to need these things. We have to consume certain things. Moreover, it's much better, all things being equal, that we attend to those things. Imagine if someone at the Department of Labor, or no, Health and Human Services, had to call you and tell you when you to take your medicine. Or call and tell you, oh, it's time to breathe, honey. Uh, <laughs> you, did, I, did you forget? Right, no, when things are working well, what you want is the one that's closest to the problem to be responsible for it. That's why we spent 18 years, I can tell you, I have children, trying to just teach kids, look, just brush your teeth, <laughs> try to show up on time, to train them to do this so that somebody else doesn't have to take care of them. All right, so there, that's not only bad, that's kind of, morally good, as long as your conscience is properly formed, that you attend to your legitimate self-interest. In fact, the, and now this might sound revolutionary, right? But the, the, uh, the golden rule presupposes this. What is the golden rule? Do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, right? Now, so what does that imply? That implies there's a way that things ought to be done to you, right? There's a way that you ought to be treated. Okay, so that implies that there are legitimate interests that you have. And if your conscience is properly formed, so that's key. You know, if you're all screwed up and you're a masochist, this isn't going to work, all right? So your conscience has to be properly formed. If it is, you can use that as a guide to figure out how you should treat other people who also have a human nature. So that, imp that presupposes this idea that there's this domain of self-interest. Now, here's Smith's main point, all right? So that wasn't overly complicated, right? It's a cr crucial point. Here is his point, right? He says, it's not from the benevolence, let me go back one, wrong quote. It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. Now, Smith, if you read more of him, what he's saying is that, look, you shouldn't want a system in which the butcher is having to visualize world peace or one in which he has to love you in order to serve you. Right, because that doesn't make sense. He doesn't know you. He's concerned about his daughter's braces. That's what interests him. And it's good that it interests him. That's the thing he has some control over. It'd be weird if he cared about somebody across town whom he had never met and more than he cared about his daughter. Right, but Smith's point is that in what he called the natural system of liberty, so again, not the law of the jungle, a system with the rule of law in which butchers aren't allowed to steal, right, if they, if they serve you rotten meat, bad, B bad reviews on Yelp and they go bankrupt, right, immediately, <laughs> right? So a rule of law, they can attend to the thing that motivates them the most and that should motivate them, their self-interest, their daughter's braces, the need for rent. And then what, but what will they do in order to fulfill those needs? That will channel their activities, right? If you're the butcher, that will channel you so that you will focus on the needs of others insofar as you'll say, okay, I need to produce meat at a price people are willing to pay at a quality that they want and to do it, if I can, better than my competitors. In other words, a market system will channel your narrow legitimate interest into socially beneficial outcomes. Right? That's a totally different argument from saying that greed is good. Right? Totally different. And that's what we should want. That's the kind of system we should want. Because we don't have omnipotent knowledge. We don't have uh, access to the needs of e everyone. Now here's the second point. Because notice in this other quote, he says, no, but sometimes people are selfish and rapacious. But notice he says in spite of their selfishness and rapacity. He doesn't say because of their selfishness and rapacity. In spite of it. So even though some butchers may in fact be really greedy, they might really like to sell rotten meat to you. They really are interested. They spend their time thinking about how they're going to put their competitors out of business. They're nasty pieces of work. But in spite of that, there's certain things they can't do. Again, they can't steal from you, but they can try to, but they're gonna get thrown in jail. Again, they could try to sell you rotten meat, but word's gonna get out, it's a bad long-term business plan. So even if you're a greedy butcher, what's the best way in this kind of system to get ahead? It's exactly the same thing. Provide meat that people want at a quality that they're willing, that they like, at a price they're willing to pay, and to try to do it better than its competitors. That's Smith's argument. It's an ingenious argument. 
is that under certain conditions, and the rules are set up right, and you have an economic system, that will channel both our legitimate interest and even our vices into socially beneficial outcomes. And that's crucial because you want an economic system that's fit for actual human beings as we exist in the world, right? It doesn't do you any good to have a nice picture of a, a perfect um, you know, nirvana, right, or kingdom of God in your head where everyone has got a Volvo in the garage and we're singing songs and, you know, you're in this little Scandinavian village and it all sounds nice, but there's actually no way to actualize it because people are sinful. So what are you going to do? That's the missed point. This is the kind of system that's fit for that. That is a genius, and it's entirely different from saying the system's based on greed. Say, no, it can channel and uh, actualize our legitimate self-interest in a way that helps others, and it can channel even our fallenness. But our fallenness is still that. It's still sin. It's still vice. All right, so you see that? OK, I promise you that's, vice. that's the only subtle point I'm going to make. All right, there is nothing else subtle. Everything else is simple. So that's the greed myth. So I hope I've dispatched that. And I hope you will think of that the next time you have that little picture in your mind of Uncle Pennybags, all right? The second myth is a zero-sum game myth. Now, a zero-sum game is a game in which it's just a, a, a game. This comes from the field of game theory. A game is just a system of rules that's set up for human interactions. And so a zero-sum game is a win-lose game. It's a game in which the rules are set up so that if there's a winner, there has to be a loser just how the rules are. So baseball, uh, you know, soccer, football, um, chess, checkers, any games that we play, if somebody wins, somebody else has to lose. That's just how it's set up. Now, in some of these, you can draw. But if there's a draw, as in chess, nobody wins. Right? So that's a zero-sum or win-lose game. Right? So there are two other kinds of games. The zero-sum or win-lose game. The second kind of game is a lose-lose game. A lose-lose game is a game in which everyone who plays ends up worse off than they were when they started. Now, this is a game, and we don't do this a lot, right? So it's very hard to come up with examples of this. Parker Brothers doesn't have any lose-lose games. Let's play that fun game where we all get hurt, right? <laughs> um, you don't do it. And so, but it's a logical possibility. Nuclear war in a confined space is, is, would be like this, obviously. Right? <laughs> you want to be really spread out if you're going to nuke somebody, I guess. Um, OK, so that's so there's win-lose or zero-sum. Following me? There's lose-lose games. And what's the third possibility? Win-win game. Now, win-win game doesn't have to be a game where everybody ends up equally well off. It just needs to be a game in which everyone who plays ends up better off than they would have been if they hadn't played the game. So to figure out if you're in a game that's win-win, you don't say, well, now that guy's better off than I am. The question is, is are you better off than you would have been if you hadn't played the game? So you see what you're doing? You're comparing yourself in the actual situation with you if you hadn't been in that situation. And if you're better off, that's a win-win game. Now, the zero-sum game myth, in this case, applies to trade. And it's the assumption that in trade, there's always has to be a winner and there has to be a loser. So if somebody benefits from a trade, somebody else had to lose from the trade. And there's lots of zero-sum games. They're just applying it to trade. Now, this is a picture um, from the Occupy Wall Street. Uh, incident after the, the financial crisis in 2008 and 2009. And it didn't actually have any lasting effect except to introduce this idea of the 1% and the 99%. And the idea is that you know the rich 1% got off with all the money and they left the rest of us 99%ers, I don't know, impoverished and destitute. And I'll never forget because there was the, one of the guys that led the Occupy Wall Street protests in Zuccotti Park in New York was mad because he had run up $60,000 in debt getting a master's in puppetry <laughs> and had a hard time paying off that debt for some reason, you know, um, and assumed it was some greedy guy on Wall Street that had caused the problem. I don't think it's him. I don't, I don't have the picture of the guy, but I, I'd like to imagine that's the puppetry guy, all right? Okay, so the question is, is this right? Well, there's actually at least, that, that's certainly true under some arrangements. If I steal from you, that's, a ze that's zero sum, right? And if I don't get arrested, in a sense, then I'm winning and you're losing. But that's not how all economic arrangements are. In fact, I learned this when I was in kindergarten, not in kindergarten, in sixth grade. Um, I grew up in the panhandle of Texas, and it's a place where it's mostly hot, um, but there are ice storms that come, and we never had snow days. And so we just get trapped inside on on, uh, during ice storms. So the teacher apparently had seen the news, and so she came to, to class with a bunch of toys. And she passed them out. It was a class like this, but we were in 
rows and individual desks. It was, assume it's five rows of five. It's approximately what it was. And she passed out all these little toys she'd gotten in the dollar section. Um, Barbie trading cards and silly putty eggs and um, uh, paddle balls, stuff like that. All different toys. They said, now I want you to look at your toy and look at everybody else's toy and then write down on a piece of paper between one and ten how much you like your toy. So it's one if you don't like it at all and it's ten if you really like it. It's totally up to you. All right? Does this make sense? And so we did that. She said, okay, now call out your number that you have. And so we called out our number and she added up the total and then she wrote it on the board. All right? And I don't remember what the number is, but let's say it was 212 or something. Okay? She said, all right, now in the first round of this game, it's called the trading game. You can freely trade with anyone else in your row. So that meant there are four potential trading partners for everyone, right? And you could trade more than once. And so the trading took place, not all that active, but a good number of the toys uh, tr uh, traded places. And then after it settled down, she said, okay, now write down on a piece of paper how much you like the toy you have. Again, between one and 10. And she had us call out the total. She added it up, wrote it on the board. And guess what happened? The number went up, right? Same toy, same people, same place. Right, two minutes later, the number goes up. So something weird's happening. I only remember this because of the second round in which she said, now you can freely trade with everyone, anyone else in the classroom. So 24 potential trading partners. And if you kind of run the combinatorial possibilities, there's lots and lots of trades that are possible at this point. So almost everything ends up getting traded uh, when this happens, right? So there's a lot of activity and it finally settles down. She says, okay, last time, write down how much you like the toy you have now between one and 10. Again, we wrote down the number, called it out, she added up the total, she wrote it on the board. And you know what happened, the number went way up. Now what is happening? I play this game, by the way, with 100 high school students every summer at the Summer Business Institute Catholic University. And I actually have a really, really sophisticated Google Sheet so I can track every player, <laughs> right, to see exactly what's happening. And it always ends up the same way unless somebody doesn't add properly, which does happen. All right, <laughs> with, dumb, with, dumb, with dumb TAs. All right, so what's happening here? <laughs> now, what is happening? That what, it's crucial that you realize there are implicit rules in place that you're not paying attention to. So there's a teacher. I, by the way, when I was in the sixth grade, went to elementary school where you could still get SWATs, right? So there's a serious rule of law. There was a partially inscribed rule of law on our hearts. So I knew I couldn't threaten the little girl behind me, right? I mean, you know, plus if I tried to do it, I'd get in trouble. So there was a rule of law. And so that meant there are only certain ways that we could interact. Right? So if a toy was ever going to trade hands, to freely trade meant that it had to be free on both sides. Right? So a free trade in this case only happens if I have something and you have something and I want what you have more than what I want, what I have, and you want what I have more than what you have. Right? So it's not an equal trade. Now this is something that for 1,500 years of Western reflection, it was said that oh, a just trade has to be a trade that's exactly equal on both sides. But if both of you valued the thing equally, you'd never trade. The only reason you ever pay anyone to cut your hair is because you value getting your hair cut more than the money, and the barber values the money more than she values the time it takes to cut your hair. That's free, right? And that's mutually beneficial. Right? Now, you may have never analyzed it before, and it's because it's just the water, we're like the fish and we're swimming in the water and we don't know we're wet. Right? That's a hard thing to do. For most of history, most societies involve uh, tribal warfare and gangs and people trying to steal from local tribes and things like that. We don't have these wide circles of mutually beneficial trade. And yet, that actually exists. So if you set up a system like that that's genuinely free on both sides, the trades that take place are going to, by definition, end up being mutually beneficial. Right? Even if nothing new is added to the system. Right? Now, it's easy to describe once it's happened. It's actually really, really hard to set up. So that's win-win. And notice that the more possible interactions there are, the wider the circle of trade, the more opportunities there are for these win-win exchanges. Right, the third and final myth that's related to this is called the materialist myth. And it's very much actually like um, uh, the zero-sum game myth, but it's subtly different. The materialist myth is a myth about the nature of wealth. The materialist myth says that wealth is not created, it's merely transferred from one person or one place to the other, like a pot of gold or a pie. So if you have a pie, um, let's say you make one of these crisscross cherry pies and you really like it and you have seven friends coming over. And the friends come over before you cut the pie. What are you going to do? 
pie's there where everybody can see it. You're going to cut eight equal slices, right? I mean, I assume you are, unless you're totally socially awkward, in which case you shouldn't be inviting <laughs> people over. And you're going to slice it eight equally, right? Now, why are you going to do that? Because it, right, if you say, well, I just really want to eat a third of that pie, everybody else is going to end up with a lot less. And they're going to see you do it. That's not going to work. You get more than your fair share. You know, pro tip, if you do that and you want to eat some, do it beforehand. Eat your piece, and then you divide it up. It's unlikely they'll notice that it doesn't make a whole pie, right? They're not going to figure it out. And so the point is that's a finite amount of material stuff. And you say, OK, yeah, um, but believe it or not, we import this idea of the economy into our minds and into our discussions all the time. When we say somebody got more than his fair share, it implies that there was a share. There was this fixed amount of stuff out there. Somebody got there early. There was this pot of gold, and he got there, he got up early, and he got way more than he should have, you know, and so mommy re divided for me. Right? That assumes this particular picture of the economy. But you might think, well, that's really kind of primitive. I mean, obviously, we're wealthier now than we were 10,000 years ago, so something's happening. It can't just be that the economy stays exactly like this. But guess what? Half the human race until 1991 were subjects to an experiment that were based upon precisely this understanding of the economy. Here's the Communist Manifesto. So this is the dummy, uh, Communist Manifesto for dummies, okay? And I've even got pictures for you here. So here's, Marx and Engels wrote this book in 1848. It's a little pamphlet you can, have any of you read it? Maybe in a poli-sci course, some of you guys have. Poli-sci, or was it economics, or? Just for fun. Okay, just for fun, yeah, exactly. Yeah, let's read some, now read Das Kapital. That's really <laughs> fun, nobody gets through that. You can read it you know, in an hour. And so here's the basic argument. So they write it in 1848. Marx is in an apartment in England. Um, and their prediction is that, it, that economic history goes through different stages. And so they were dialectical materialists. And they said everything is the result of different conflicts between different classes of society, right? And your consciousness is literally determined by whatever class you're in. And so you have this early primitive utopia, kind of like the Garden of Eden. And then you have the thousands of years where you have slave states, like ancient Egypt, right? Where you have these, these uh, uh, you know, autocrats that are in charge, and then you've got massive states of slaves basically working for them. And that eventually gives way in the Middle Ages to a feudalist system in which you have lords who own large tracts of land, and you have peasants that work the land. They have kind of obligations. Peasants aren't free to go do other jobs, but nevertheless, the lord has certain obligations. And, and um, you know, that was at least an improvement over slavery. That eventually gave way to industrial capitalism, what Marx called capitalism. Now remember, I'm using the word capitalism in Marx's sense. Now I'll let you in on a little secret. Marx is the one that popularized that word. If you read Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, he didn't use the word capitalism. It's a Marxist word. Yeah, and what he was talking about was a system in which the capitalists are the guys who own the stuff, they own the means of production, and then they hire workers, they hire the proletariat, right? pay them as little as they can to work in factories. All right, so here's basically the picture. Imagine I own a bunch of textile factories and I hire people and I pay them hourly wages to make shirts, and then I take the shirts out to market and I try to sell the shirts for more than they cost to produce. And if I do that, I sell them for more than they cost to produce, that's profit. But Marx called that a surplus value. He said, you're actually exploiting the customer and the worker. And the reason is because he believed this theory that I won't spend a bunch of time on called the labor theory of value, which defined the value of something in terms of how much it costs to produce. So the shirt is only worth however much labor it took to produce it and no more. And so if you sell it for more than that, you're exploiting that person, and you're then also not giving the fruit of the labor to the worker. Right? So Marx is a, very, and this is a deeply flawed understanding of economic value that no economist believes. In fact, even modern day Marxists deny this. Right? But, but this is what Marx thought. So this is all arguments based on this. All right? But he said, capitalists aren't stupid. They don't go, like, go to an Indian casino and squander all of their wealth. They don't do that. They actually take it back and they reinvest it in their factories, and they improve the machines, and they make the workers more productive. So now they can actually fire some of the workers. They can pay the ones that they have a little bit less. And then they can they take the shirts, and they sell it for even more, and they make more profit. And they bring it back, and they continue this process. right? And over time, all the wealth ends up in the hands of a few capitalists or monopolists. 
right? So the, the capitalist at the beginning, let's say it's England in 1700, let's say. And this is the uh, capitalist here. And so this is the total amount of wealth in the economy, right? 1700 in England. This is all the workers, and then they start out with about 70% of the wealth, and, and that's maybe 15% in the hands of the capitalist. But this is what Marx says happens. Is that over time, the total amount of wealth shifts, all right? And so whereas before the majority of the wealth was in the hands of the workers, now you've got 99% of the population here, and you've got 1% of the population here, the owning class, right? It's an, it's an inevitable result of this capitalist process, and you can guess what happens at this point, right? It's a violent revolution. The laborers rise up, um, they confiscate the means of production, they liquidate the capitalists, and then there's this temporary stage called socialism in which the state owns everything on behalf of the people. It's gray for obvious reasons, right? But what you might not know is that no Marxist thought this was the end point. If you had asked somebody in the Soviet Union, a true believer in the 70s, it's like you're standing in bread lines for four hours a day. This is a disaster. They say, well, we know that. This is a necessary evil we have to get to to get to the communist utopia in which the state withers away. And everyone will have plenty, no one will have want, they won't have a desire for things, and there'll just be this kind of bounty, this communist utopia. That's what Marxists were hoping for, and they always got stuck at the socialist stage. Now, why is that? It's because it's completely out of touch with basic economic reality at almost every point. What actually happens? Do you notice anything about the circle? It stays the same size, right? So notice the wealth just moves from one group to the other. The whole argument's based on that. And so it turns out you never had a communist revolution in any advanced capitalist country. Because this is what actually happens in market reality. And I know this is not the most impressive animation you've ever seen. <laughs> it's the best I can do, though, right? But it, it makes the point. This is market reality. <laughs> right? The pie grows. This is amazing, right? Look, it, goes, it gets bigger. Now, this, this is relevant, though, because what it means is that it's actually possible under certain conditions in a certain economy for somebody to get fabulously wealthy, not by transferring wealth from one place to the other, but by creating wealth that was not there before. The late Steve Jobs did not get rich stealing iPhones from homeless people. That's just that's not how it worked. <laughs> right? That wealth wasn't already out there, and then he confiscated it and brought it to Cupertino, California. It's not how it works. Right? He participated in a process of wealth creation in which he created wealth that was not there before for both himself and for others. Now, how is that possible? Well, I would argue that actually the, the Christian and biblical understanding of the human person, if you have that view of the human person, you should have expected something like this all along. So what's the, what's the biblical view of the human person? God creates everything that is. He calls everything into existence, right? And then he creates human beings uniquely. They're the only things in all of creation that are created in God's image and likeness. And remember, he creates man and woman in his image, and then he commands them to be fruitful and multiply. Now, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? If you're going to try to figure this out just from that first chapter of Genesis, what would you guess? Well, what is it about this God? Well, this God exercises sovereignty. In his case, it's supreme sovereignty over everything. He exercises creativity, and he exercises freedom. God creates, say, the sand, right? But he doesn't immediately create everything that could be made from sand. He leaves it to us to create things like fiber optic cables <coughs> and computer chips, right, based in silica. God could have created those directly, but instead, as Thomas Aquinas said, God grants to creatures the dignity of causality. So God, the creator with a capital C, creates a world with lots of little creators with a lowercase c, that are able to participate in that creative activity. So he leaves it to us to transform the material world into new things that he didn't tr create directly. So what we want in an economic system, then, is the best system that's capable of channeling our legitimate self-interest, It's capable of channeling, insofar as it's possible, even our vices into socially beneficial outcomes, and that is best able to channel our capacity as value creators created the image of God so that we can create wealth that was not there before. And if you ask the question that way, and then you say, okay, so what's the system 
that uniquely is able to do that, there's actually only one answer. It's free enterprise. Thanks very much. My wife was texting me right at the end. So she's like, okay, finish up, buddy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I know you guys probably have to leave. I'm happy to take some questions. I don't want to hold you too long, but if you have any. Um, I was reading uh, Fatal Conceit mm -hmm. with Hayek. Um, yes. And he it's a great of, book. Uh, I don't know if you, if you can really call it trashing Aristotle. But yes, he does. He totally does. Yeah. And it, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. Um, but one thing that he says, essentially Aristotle makes the same mistake that Rand did, except on the flip side. Right. Um, and that in the 13th century, and essentially the Catholicism of the time adopted yeah. that view of markets. That's right. Um, yeah. Do you think like there's still a remnant of that, like particularly with the Jesuits, or? Well, it's it's a little more complicated than that. Believe it or not, I have a whole appendix to the, in Money, Greed, and God where I analyze Hayek's that text. Um, it, okay, so it's a literally, <laughs> literally in the appendix is that an, an analysis of that text. So it is complicated. So the key thing from Aristotle that was a really a mistake was that Aristotle, um, for actually pretty good reasons at the time, every culture, you guys may, may or may not know this, every ancient culture uh, thought that charging interest on a money loan was immoral. It was a sin called usury. In fact, if you read Dante's Divine Comedy, the usurers they're in the seventh level of hell. They're literally two circles away from Satan on his throne. So, I mean, you've got adulterers and murderers. Or they're, it's in the better spots, right? They're, I mean, that's where the usurers are. Now, what was going on was that they had assumed Aristotle's understanding of money as sterile. So money is just a unit of exchange, but it's not, it doesn't actually have any value in itself. It just makes exchange easier. But the things that have value are the cows that you raise or the houses that you build. Or, or things like that. But you, if you lend somebody money, you have the right to have it given back to you, but you don't have the right to charge for it because it doesn't have any value in itself. It'd be like charging, some, it's one thing to charge somebody for five yards of wool fabric, but you couldn't charge somebody for five yards abstractly. Okay, this sounds very strange, but that's how Aristotle was thinking of money, right? And that's how every ancient culture was thinking of money. But very, so very, very slowly, it started to dawn on people, once there was a banking system developed and people actually had a surplus of money, then extra money wasn't just something that got stored in a mattress or a hole in the ground. You, they put it in banks initially just to keep it uh, from safekeeping, but then banks realized we don't need to keep all these deposits. We can pay the, the depositors a little money for letting us keep it, and then we can lend some of that out again. Right? And so now the money is actually being put to work. So it's not sterile, it's fertile. And so if the bank is charging interest, they're actually charging for something. They're charging for the opportunity cost uh, that they forego because they don't have the money to use for something else. And then they're charging for the risk that um, the money might not get paid back. And so this is why now the Vatican participates in banking, right? So the usury, uh, they, they don't accept this particular uh, argument of Aristotle. So Aristotle's chock full of great insights. This is one place where uh, he led a lot of people astray, and like the, the Muslim world is still, Muslim banking doesn't charge interest. And they get around it by charging fees and stuff like that. But this is all based upon this particular assumption, not just of Aristotle, but the entire ancient world, that money was sterile. Whereas in fact, under certain conditions, money's fertile. It can be, and that's what an entrepreneur does. He or she uses money to create more wealth. It's like a tool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a great question. All right, one more question. I any yes, no questions? Those are always my favorites. <laughs> I answer a lot of those. Well, we're after 8 o'clock, so I'll, I'll let it go. But if any of you guys have uh, other questions, I'll hang around for a while. And um, if any of you are interested in this, I mentioned to a couple of folks. There's actually a conference held by a uh, think tank called the Acton Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And they hold a conference called the Acton University every summer for three and a half days in Grand Rapids, Michigan. 1,000 people come to this conference from 80 different countries. And if you're a student and you apply and get accepted, they pay your way. It's an amazing experience. So if you're at all interested in these issues, I'd encourage you just Google Acton University 2020 and, uh, and apply. And you can explore these for several days with people from all around the world. All right, thanks so much.